Shaw Cable, dedicated to the community, service, and you, proudly presents Spotlight on UNBC, the University of Northern British Columbia. Brought to you in part by Northland Chrysler Jeep and Northwood Pulp and Timber Limited. Northland Chrysler Jeep, home of the number one selling minivan in North America, is located at 3rd and Vancouver in Prince George. Northland has been in business since 1984. Northland Chrysler Jeep is a proud sponsor of Spotlight on UNBC, a program designed to let you know what's happening at your university. Northland Chrysler Jeep, your Eagle and Dodge truck dealer, is where people make the difference. Northwood Pulp and Timber is a proud sponsor of Shaw Cable 10 and its volunteer-produced television programs. Northwood also supports UNBC. As a partner in progress, Northwood has donated $350,000 towards the scholarship fund. When matched by the government, it represents a contribution of $700,000. Hi, and welcome to the UNBC Student Residence. Actually, this is a trapper's hut that was used by two people who had a trap line here on Cranbrook Hill. UNBC's Prince George campus is being built just over there. My name is Robin Edercombe, and welcome to another Spotlight on UNBC program. Over the next half hour, we'll update you on all the latest happenings at the University of Northern British Columbia. on UNBC with your host Rob Van Adricum. Phase one of this campus is now complete and by the time this program is aired construction will have begun on phase two. In order to remain within the capital budget and still open the campus on time a number of design changes have recently been made. Well we, we took um, uh, three different approaches to, to the problem and uh, three different avenues uh, where we looked at out, outright deletion mm -hmm. of, of uh, materials and scope of work. Uh, substitution and standardization and we, we managed to achieve uh, uh, significant economies uh, with strictly just standardizing and uh, for example uh, light fixtures, um, plumbing fixtures, uh, carpeting, uh, window um, um, treatments and, yeah. and uh, details, glaz glazing and fenestration. Um, we standardized throughout the campus and uh, just by doing that, uh, we both achieved immediate uh, cost savings and also long-term um, savings in maintenance and, and upkeep and, and replacement. Yeah. Um, substituting, uh, for example, everyone speaks of the slate that we've deleted, but really we haven't deleted the slate. We've deleted it in areas mm -hmm. where actually um, it will make for a much stronger feeling space. It's, that's essentially the student corridor street in the Agora building and where it's a polished concrete which looks very much like terrazzo which is a, a very beautiful material mm -hmm. and, and um, we've deleted the uh, slate from there but uh, we found a substitute for the slate uh, a different tile which looks very much like slate yeah. and uh, have replaced it and, and uh, achieved significant cost savings just by uh, substituting one material with another the buildings are not stripped down to, their, to concrete uh, mm -hmm. walls, ceilings and floors um, they are still uh, very beautiful spaces, well-finished spaces, uh, spaces that are finished um, to last uh, with durable materials and in keeping with, uh, in fact, above and beyond the normal standards found of other university buildings in this province and other parts of, of uh, North America for that matter. I should note that um, major electrical, mechanical, heating and ventilating um, systems um, those were where the major changes were and major economies were found uh, to, simply by standardizing uh, across all the buildings on the campus. And these are changes that no one will see. They're all changes in ceiling plenums and behind walls and, and what have you or under floor slabs. Cost uh, savings will also be realized by expanding the construction schedule, but that won't have any effect on students planning to attend classes at this campus in the fall of 1994. 
Buildings with an administrative focus will be given a lower priority in terms of the building schedule, while student-oriented facilities like the library and Agora will be open on time. Paul Zanette is a native of Prince George who worked for the Boston architectural firm which designed the master plan or campus blueprint. He came back to BC to see the plans take shape. When we were doing the master plan and designing the concept in, in, in Boston, uh, we were very conscious of the whole notions of connectivity and, and regional expression. We were concerned about the view from the campus, which is absolutely magnificent. Um, on a clear day, you can see two, two layers of, of, um, of the Rocky Mountains, two ranges of the Rocky Mountains. But um, also as important, and for me more, more satisfying, was that exercise we did in Boston, which is really hypothetical. Uh, to ensure that we would be able to see the buildings on the campus. But we really were not quite convinced. Uh, you're not sure until the yeah. buildings are up. Yeah. And everywhere we drive around the city now, we can see the buildings. We can see the corners and of the lab building and, and the library because their superstructure is up completely. We see the faces of the library. We even now see the tower of the food service um, part of the Agora building. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic, and that to me has been the most satisfying. The 1992-93 academic year is history, or rather was history, English and psychology. Many more courses will be available this September, so public information sessions are planned to give you more information on what will be available. Taking advantage of 25 degree temperatures, a recent information meeting was held in Fort George Park and featured UNBC's Vice President Academic, Ken Coates. Quick Start is not designed to be a very extensive program. Our expectations to, for this year uh, are that we will will we'll have uh, probably several hundred students uh, altogether enrolled in different courses and programs. It does not represent uh, much more, unfortunately, at this time, than sort of a sampling, an indication of where we're going, with more than enough courses, as Nicole said, for somebody who's in first year, somebody who's in second year, or somebody who's looking for a full third and fourth year program. Uh, it is doesn't represent everything we're doing, it does represent a range of the kinds of things that we have ongoing. I would suggest very strongly then that as you start picking your courses, you start asking the essential question, who's teaching these courses? What kind of instructors am I going to have? Are, the, the, because that, the, the answer to that will determine the quality of your education. Are you going to get an education that will be as good as any university in the country? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, this year and the next couple of years, uh, it will be better than ever because we are hiring a whole bunch of people who are so enthusiastic about the job that they've taken on, are so committed to come up to Northern British Columbia, they're committed to establishing a new standard of how universities operate, both in British Columbia and in Canada as a whole. Um, the benefits will flow disproportionately to you as some of the first students at UNBC. Teaching centers for face-to-face -face teaching will again be located in Terrace, Dawson Creek, Fort St. John and Prince George, but students anywhere in northern BC will have access through distance education. We've been doing some very exciting work lately, looking at some other ways of, of, of organizing these courses from a distance. Um, as I'm sure you've heard in your own distance education classes, the telephone is wonderful 1950s technology. Uh, you could have done those same courses in 1950, cost a little bit more for the line, but the same sort of thing. Uh, there are some wonderful new technologies available. Uh, we were just down at Washington State University uh, where they have an interactive television system where you have class you're, you're watching you're watching your classmates in Fort St. John you're actually seeing them on the TV screen the professor back and forth um, by 94 we fully expect to have that kind of a system up and running the quick start mini calendar has already been sent to every home in northern BC but additional copies can be obtained from UNBC a UNBC employee was in Boston recently, but not for an academic conference. Daryl Bailey was in Boston to run 26 miles. The UNBC systems librarian is somewhere in that group of 8,000 people who recently ran in the Boston Marathon. Oh, and uh, he's the one wearing the yellow hat. How nervous were you? I wasn't... Uh no, there was no, I've done, I've raced so many marathons now that I don't really get nervous. Uh, it's just another day, even though it was Boston, it was really important, it's another race. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I, there's no question of uh, being nervous. 
Although you want to finish well because you've got all these people on the course and you don't want to be that picture of the agony um, broadcast over national media. So you want to look good coming down the, down the stretch. I, I think the thing that I was really thinking about was uh, to not go out too fast because it, there's immediate, in the first mile there's a 130 foot drop. And you tend, if you, tend, if you go out too fast, you're going to pay for it later in the race. So the idea was to get a nice, even pace start, not get caught up in the race, and to also make sure I wasn't trampled. Well, because you can see at the beginning that a lot of people couldn't, you couldn't even run because there were so many people. A lot of people were just yes. walking for the first little while. That's true. That was especially true with the people in, in further back in the, in the, everybody seated according to qualifying time. And uh, the people with faster times get the uh, positions up close to the front. I so I was, I was up close to the front, so I didn't <laughs> have to walk. Uh, it's just immediately, as soon as the gun off, there's a big surge and yeah. everybody yeah. at the front moves very yeah. quickly. Yeah. And you just want to avoid uh, tripping uh, and getting uh, trampled. 8,000 people. What did it, what was that like? It's crowded. Because you're on a, you're on a, uh, a road that's about as wide as this track. So they, they're going, it seems like they go back for miles, but it's probably not that long. It's, uh, it's really crowded and, um, and you just want to make sure you get a good start. Outside of work, what sort well, of things do you do? Well, my typical day runs like this. I get up, you know, 5.30 and say this morning, I went out, I, I met a fellow to go out running and we took it fairly easy, and about an eight to 10 miler. And at noon hour, I'll, I'll go out and do about 20 miles on the bike. Then tonight, I'll go for a, a, a float in the pool. <laughs> a float. A, a 50 lap float. Well, <laughs> probably closer to 120. <laughs> okay, okay, now I feel real bad. <laughs> but what do you see now in terms of for the next couple of years? Are you planning to go to Boston again? Yeah, I'm planning, New York? I'm planning to go to Boston next year because I'll be a master and I'll have a really good starting number. And I want to do a lot better than I did this year. What's, you finished in the top 10% top this yeah, year. What are you right. looking for next year then? I would like to be in the top 4%. It was always my dream to go to Boston. And I thought, geez, I better go this year or, or I may never, or you never know, the wheels may fall off yeah. and you won't get the opportunity. And you always say to yourself, boy, I should have gone to Boston when I had the opportunity. So it was a big thrill for me. And, and the fact that there were over a million spectators was, was, uh, was something to experience because they're calling out your name going down the road. And, and um, it's, it's quite exciting. It, it sure makes every other race pale mm -hmm. in comparison. The university's new program chair of history, Robin Fisher, has been awarded a $37,000 federal research grant. The research program will involve two projects, the first being a history of Native people in B.C. since 1890, and the second being a photographic history of B.C.'s Native communities. UNBC Chancellor Iona Campagnolo spoke in early May during the ninth annual Northern Lights College Convocation Ceremony in Dawson Creek. It is not our tradition to seek post-secondary education but you are changing that. All who have preceded you in this place and all who will come after you in this place and all those in the other colleges and in the universities will gradually change that culture. We're all challenged to fight the mythological negatives and stereotypes of academia and to build our own systems to extend to families everywhere in Europe in the North as an article of faith. You know, it used to be said that when I grow up, I want a house and a car, and I want this and that and a family and so on. Well, just let us make sure that we say we want those things, but we also want our post-secondary education as one of the major goals of our lives. The college graduated 380 people during the event, and they were also addressed by the chair of the college board and president, Jim Casson. And I see new opportunities coming every day. One we have represented here today is UNBC. We're currently working with them on something uh, as novel as a bachelor's degree in aviation maintenance management. It'll be the first one available in Canada. And there'll soon be other programs where you'll be able to use your college background to 
shorten the length of time that it takes to get a degree. There's a Bachelor of Technology degree in the works. Just keep watching. A lot of things are happening. The Chancellor will be in the Peace River region again the second weekend in June when the university's interim governing council meets in Dawson Creek on June 12th. Dawson Creek played host to a telecommunications conference in early May, sponsored in part by UNBC. A number of university officials attended the event, including Dennis Macknack, the director for regional operations, Peace River Regional Coordinator Nick Petrozak, and telecommunications supervisor Michael Chu. Communications will be a key element in the maintenance of a strong regional presence for UNBC, and the conference examined how telecommunications can be a vehicle for economic diversification. A representative of the Northern Region Center on Japan's island of Hokkaido visited UNBC in late April. The Northern Region Center was established in 1972 and conducts research on the life, culture, and economics of northern communities. UNBC took part in an arts walk in Prince George in early April. The university had the Prince George campus model and architectural drawings on display. In addition, one of the ceremonial chairs used in the inaugural convocation ceremony was displayed. The chairs and the mace talking stick were carved by Hazelton artist Ron Sebastian. Before long, UNBC will have its full heraldic arms, its coat of arms, crest, and formal motto. In early May, a meeting was held between the Chief Herald of Canada and renowned Haida artist Bill Reed on creation of UNBC's heraldic symbols. Those symbols must represent the whole UNBC area, and those being considered include a Kermode bear, killer whale, and woodland caribou. Full details will appear on a future Spotlight on UNBC. So. UNBC was proud to present well-known Canadian author Timothy Finley recently as part of its public lecture series. Well, it is terrific to be here. It really is. And this story of the saga of the smithereens is really quite, quite wonderful. <laughs> it was on the radio this morning. I gather there was a piece in the paper. And I just met them. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I think it's marvelous. And they have a, a, a sign on their, on their minibus that says, Findlay or bust. <laughs> and they've driven all day to get here. And, uh, and my friend Bill Whitehead, and I walked up to, to say hello and to, and to be greeted by them. And Bill put up his hand and said, he's Findlay, I'm bust. <laughs> so <laughs> Oddly enough, they turned us both down. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. The public lecture series uh, had have, already presented such household so names as Joe Levi Clark, Roberta Bondar, and, and Gordon Wilson. Academic lectures from candidates for positions at UNBC will certainly slow down over the summer months, but the month of May featured candidates for women's studies, anthropology, forestry, outdoor recreation, tourism, and biology. So by having an abrupt change in river flow, rather than a gradual decline through the summer period, I had massive die-off of my seedling crop. I went from 1,000 seedlings per square meter to about four in the space of two weeks, and by September, I only found about three seedlings over that whole stretch of river, river sandbar that I had been working on. If the river had dropped gradually, then the seedlings would have continued to grow their roots and access that groundwater. But by maintaining this artificially high water level, which you would think would be a benefit, the trees actually stopped further growth into the ground. And then when we had a quick drop, it's game over. <coughs> and this is the end result at the end of the summer. Tomatosis root disease attacks mostly spruce and pine in the boreal forest. It causes four major losses. One of them is outright mortality. The fungus causes a uh, disruption to the root system by decaying the roots, and eventually the tree starves to death. Also, the decay in the roots can lead to wind throw. Once the tree is on the ground, the decay processes occur much faster with other kinds of fungi, and the tree is essentially lost for harvesting purposes. The third type of loss is when the fungus infects the root system, it can grow up into the butt of the tree in the lower portion of the log. It can grow between two and five meters up the stem of the tree. That means that the lower portion of the tree, the part that's the largest and therefore the most valuable, is lost as far as being usable timber. And finally, because the roots are dysfunctional, the 
tree is not able to take up as much nutrients and water as it would like. So there's less energy available for allocation to growth and the leader growth begins to shut down, also the diameter growth begins to decrease. Despite the fact a guided tour of the Prince George campus appeared on the last Spotlight on UNBC program, the demand for tours of the Prince George campus is as strong as ever. Between mid-April and mid-May, over 400 people from various groups were taken on campus tours, and Sunday afternoon public tours will resume in early June. Talk about the building of UNBC, and it could include everything from the academic programs to this campus. For some people, the building of UNBC has been a project lasting six years and counting. The first president of the Interior University Society and the chair of the Interim Governing Council is included in that group. Murray Sadler has been involved with UNBC from the beginning, even back to 1987 when a group of dreamers wanting a northern university set up shop in a small office building on Queensway Street in Prince George. It was not known at the time, but it has proven to be the first building ever occupied by people formerly working for the University of the North. In 1987, the real push towards establishing this University of Northern British Columbia wasn't called that back then, but that's when the, the concept started. And right in this building was when the, the first office was where the public campaign began. began. And what were some of your remembrances of how the public viewed the university back then in 1987? Um, I think that uh, in 1987, in the fall of 1987, when we, uh, it became publicly known that there was a group wanting to promote the establishment of a university, there wasn't uh, a, a broad base of acceptance of the idea. Uh, it, was, um, it was just that. It was just an idea. Uh, people were intrigued by the fact that there was actually a formal group that had been organized to, uh, to promote it. I think people were generally thought well of the idea and were encouraging, but uh, there was also a lot of skepticism on the part of a lot of people mm. um, about whether or not it was a, a waste of time. Well, how did you get involved personally? Um, I had been a director of the um, Prince George Chamber of Commerce, and uh, as a director I chaired its education um, committee so that when um, Charles McCaffrey called a meeting of people uh, to come to the boardroom at CNC, uh, I was invited to come. And that was in the spring of 1987. And uh, that meeting was called essentially to discuss degree granting opportunities uh, for Prince George. It wasn't to talk about a university, it was to talk about and, and to complain about the fact that there were not many degree granting opportunities for students in Prince George. We talked about what Simon Fraser University was doing with the teachers and about some other programs that was being done in the First Nations communities, but it was mostly uh, to, to just sort of talk about what we might do to enhance degree granting opportunities. Uh, university was not yet mentioned. Mm -hmm. Even though it has been only about six years from going to concept to reality, do you think people are forgetting a little bit of the history of where UNBC has come from? The thing I, I feel when I talk to people is that they don't realize how far we've come in, in such a short period of time. Six years seems like a long time, but uh, when you're talking about starting from um, raising, up, in effect, the political will to create the university, starting from zero and arriving in a place where we have, uh, I don't know, some, somewhere in the order of uh, $30 million worth of facilities uh, already constructed mm -hmm. uh, on our site uh, here in Prince George, and um, about 40 academics hired and all the other infrastructure that's in place. I mean, people don't realize how much has been done in such a short period of time. It took Simon Fraser University about 20 years to go from concept to reality and yet it has taken UNBC only about half a dozen years to do the same thing. Do you think that has been overly ambitious? I think we're going to have to wait for history to judge that one. Uh, I don't think that we have uh, 
have been uh, so fast as to completely abandon touch with the reality of, of uh, academic quality and, uh, and, and the quality of the facilities and these other things. Uh, yes, we have pushed, and uh, yes, it has been done in a rush, and uh, yes, if we had more time to do it, it would have been nice. But then you can say that about almost anything. So um, I think that uh, our timeline has been uh, tight, and I know it is hard on some people. It's hard on those people in particular who are working for the university now. Um, but uh, I think uh, that people who are pushed to their limits uh, often perform very well. When the Interior University Society held its last meeting about three years ago now, and it sort of passed the baton, as it were, to the Interim Governing Council. Um, do you see that as sort of a, a transformation as well, going from the dream to the reality? Well, it, it, one could say that. It certainly would be an event that could be, uh, could be used to, to mark the transition from the dream to, to reality. Um, I have to tell you that I certainly had a lot of disbelief uh, about it even then. And even though I was sort of in the center of it at all, during, through all of that, uh, it, it almost seemed dreamlike to me. And uh, I was very anxious to start to put some shape and some personalities to the, to, to the University of Northern British Columbia so that uh, it was and did start to become a reality. You know, even today, uh, although we have done so much and we've, we've uh, created a hundred new jobs in Prince George and uh, uh, three or four uh, in the north and three or four in the west, um, people still look at the whole thing with some degree of skepticism about whether or not it's real. And uh, so I guess that for each person, the step from a dream to reality will depend upon uh, their particular test. For some, I think that step will be taken when we open for business on a full-scale basis in the fall of 1994. Uh, for others, it probably won't be meaningful until they in fact have uh, someone that's closely associated or related to them actually taking courses. Or in the case of an employer, someone who actually hires someone and has somebody working in their business or in their uh, profession who uh, who took their education at UNBC, uh, it will be different. Uh, it'll, it will be different for different people. When you started six years. The interview ago, with Murray Sadler will continue department. on the next Spotlight and on UNBC. Back over the past six years. Thank you for tuning in to the fifth edition of Spotlight on UNBC. Over my right shoulder, you can see the library that's being built on the Cranbrook Hill campus. My name is Rob Van Adercombe. Tune in next month to find out more of what's happening at the University of Northern British Columbia.